Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. You'll notice on your program that that isn't exactly right. If what I say today you don't agree with, my name then is Norm A. And if you like anything I say, then my name is Jack and I too am an alcoholic. Uh, Norm found that he has a daughter who all of a sudden grew up and graduates tonight, and so he couldn't be here. And I was very happy to be asked to stand in his stead. Uh, Norm and I see along the same lines in the philosophy of Alcoholics Anonymous, so you'll hear about the same, as I think we do in all the meetings. But since I do substitute once in a while for people like this, I like to introduce, as I did, uh, just to protect myself, you see? If you don't like me, that isn't my fault, because I'll tell you that the notes I have are the ones he gave me on the way up here. So, most gratifying to be here at this particular conference. I've heard about these for some time, of course, and have never had the opportunity to be in the area when you were holding one. And to sit here last night in this room, filled with as many people as who were here, just to hear about one man's experience prior to AA and the results of his coming here was most gratifying and I think speaks very highly for the organization itself of Alcoholics Anonymous, but perhaps more so to the personal philosophy that each of us who come here seem to derive from the examples and the experiences of those who preceded us. Uh, Dick is a real wonderful guy. You heard him last night. The best press agent I've had in years. Uh, there's a payola to that, too, you know. We belong to the same stag group down in Los Angeles, and he didn't know I was coming up here. So the first thing I said to him when he walked in the door downstairs is, you know, I know you, Richard. And I will be back at the group, so you had better get up there and do us proud. And don't tell any of these stories that you used to tell us when you first came into the meeting. And so in order to keep my big mouth shut, he made a very wonderful pitch last night, which I will relate relate back to (coughs) our uh, group of uh, non-inventory-taking members of our stag group. You know... Talking about this particular philosophy is one of the great pleasures that a drunk will ever have, I believe, because it allows the latitudes of my thoughts and of my discussions over the years that I have been able to maintain my soberness with the philosophy of AA and to discuss with you how I feel about it and how I interpret it. And to know that if you do not agree with what I say, that that does not necessarily make me wrong, nor you right. But that I have, within the confines of this organizational setup, the right to my opinion, as long as my opinion is that which keeps me sober. Because that's why I came here. To get and to stay sober. Through the years that I've been here, I have created for myself a basic principle of living, I believe, that makes it unnecessary for me to find a situation, at least as of today, that is strong enough that it will send me out once again to take a drink, and in taking the drink to make me walk from one side of the road of life across the street and to join the unhappy throng going in the same direction, but most certainly stumbling much more than walking gaily. I started for the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 12 years old, and I made a concerted effort to get here for the next 20 years. I worked real hard to find the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, and in that working, I did all the things I believe that most of us who come here have done. Maybe the locale was a bit different, and maybe the incidents themselves might deviate a little bit from yours, but I'm sure that basically those things that I did were the same that you did, The things that I did that finally got to me were those things which made me uncomfortable with myself. 
I'm not one of those who was particularly interested in the effect on the people about me at all. Because, you see, I started out on my path towards AA with the basic ingredient of a drunk, the one that most people search a long time for and very rarely have, and that is somebody who you can logically and honestly blame everything you do on. Now, when I was 12 years old, I was taken back to visit my grandmother in Illinois. My father and I went back. My grandmother was the best homebrew maker in this little town of Peru, Illinois, and the German people in that town have a habit of each Saturday night meeting around the kitchen table and having a beer bust. All the family that is in the area comes in and you sit around Grandma's table and you just have a real good old family get-together, drinking beer and eating the smear case and what goes with it. And I did not want to join this group because they were serving Limburger cheese. And there's just something about that that I don't like. And my father was a little bigger than I was in those days. And he insisted that I join this family group. And I did. And they passed me the beer bucket. And I took the first drink of alcohol I had had. And I proceeded from that moment till the moment of my coming into AA to walk as rapidly as possible to the doors of my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Because that first drink created in me the sensation, as I recall, like nothing else that I had ever had. And I got drunk. And I passed out. And I was put to bed, and the next morning I woke up and my uncle was there with a cold bottle of beer, and he handed it to me and he said, here, drink this, and it'll take care of what ails you, and I did, and it did, and it was wonderful. And you know, for the many years that were to follow, it used to perturb me about you stupid people. I would get up in the morning and get well, like I had been taught, take it the morning after, and I would see you people suffer. And I knew what you were suffering from, and if you'd only take a couple of drinks, you'd get well. And if you took three or four, you'd get weller, and weller, and weller, and then you got sicker and sicker, but that was beside the point, because you could get well the next day. But you would suffer it out. And I'd think, my gosh, how stupid can they be when all it is a couple of drinks? And then I come to AA, and I find out that when you start doing this, you got a problem. You may be an alcoholic, this morning drink effect. So you see, I was one, if that be a criteria, from the very first time I took a drink. I did the normal things that any good drinking alateen would do. Well, uh, with one exception, I wasn't like most of you. I didn't start right out being in trouble. I had uh, uh, quite a good social drinking pattern. I didn't get in trouble until I was 14 when I got picked up the first time for common drunk. And so I had two good, solid years of social drinking. Just wonderful, you see. And then I managed to get myself picked up in my own hometown for being drunk. Common drunk, it's called nowadays. And this in itself was something for me to talk about for many years. My father was a local mortician. He belonged to every service club you can think of, every lodge there was. He was on the school board and the, the city council and you name it, and he was on it. And the chief of police lived in our apartments right next door to the mortuary, and the chief of police picked me up for common drunk. And this is pretty hard to do. Of course, I was told this was to act as an example for the rest of the boys in town, and it was a good example because we periodically made the jail as a group from then on out. Good example, isn't it? But doesn't everybody do this? If you drink, if you drink, sooner or later, if you drink to excess at least, Sooner or later, you're going to run afoul of those people about you, and they're going to have to do something about your drinking. And the normal procedure is to take you out of society, one way or the other. Well, these little things sort of went on for some time, and then it became apparent that I have one defect of character that uh, came early with me, real early. I'm one of those who believe, since I came into AA, that the step which tells us about removing our shortcomings does it mean that literally, that it merely means, at least to me, that I become aware, and acutely so, at these uh, shortcomings, and that when I become aware of them at this moment, I must do something about them? And one of the shortcomings that I have, uh, and still have, and I, I suppose will always have, is that I like to steal. I think that there is a great thrill in going out and copying something and not getting caught, whether it's a candy bar or what happens. 
But I also found out very early that if I gave in to this particular attitude that I had, that there was a payment to be rendered. As I went on through my life and up to now, I find out that everything that I do has a payment to it. If I do something good, somewhere along the way, I will be repaid in kind. Something good will happen to me. And if I do something that is not good, then I will receive payment in time. I'll get something happening to me one way or the other that is most uncomfortable. And I found this to be true as I look back in retrospect over all of these years, even back then for drinking. When I stole things, I had the ready explanation that I didn't really steal them, I only borrowed them. Nobody really steals. All of us had the idea that we would return whatever we had, or they didn't need it anyway. Uh, I always felt my friends with their cars either could get another one or do the same as I did, borrow the neighbor's. And in order to be repaid for this, I was given a choice, reform school or military school. And they sent me to military school, and I'm not so sure today that the right, right uh, uh, choice was made. But that was a son of a gun. That, that military school was a real good one. Uh, prison, I go into a lot of them now. Prisons were not quite as strict as they were back there, but I guess it didn't hurt me. I managed to indulge in drinking at every opportunity. I managed to find the local bootlegger in this little town in Kansas and to use that facility as often as possible. I managed to do a lot of what we call boring time in this school for being drunk. But along with it, I managed to come up in my end of my junior year with a 98.6 average in, in scholarship. And I returned to my hometown, now the pride of my family, with this high average, my sister had just completed her senior year in school and had come out as a valedictorian, and now they were going to have another one in the family, and this is wonderful, and all of those things that my father had been responsible for prior to this, because believe me, any time I did anything, I would say to my father when he would get unhappy, look, friend, don't talk to me, you started me drinking. If you hadn't made me drink that first drink, I probably wouldn't have gotten drunk, and then I would not have been doing these things, so it's your fault, not mine. And this is a wonderful position to be in. Boy, you've got to take no, nothing for what you're doing on yourself. Pass it on to somebody and let them take care of it. And he took care for years and years and years. But now he was going to be proud because I returned to my hometown. And I was going back into my senior year in high school. And I was going to graduate at the top of the class and be the valedictorian like my sister was. He had a couple of things to find out in that last year. And he found them out very quickly because I ended up barely, barely in the upper third of the class. It didn't take me long to find out that without this regimentation, without this strong control, that I would not do much on my own. Well, this was the early part of my background of drinking. I went on through college, never made it clear through. You can't drink and keep up a college career either, you know. But I learned things as I went along. I learned how it was to be an alcoholic, how to be a drunk. I learned the, the things that you do to remain an alcoholic. I did those things which were necessary to keep me drinking, to get even with the people who didn't like what I was doing. But I always paid for it. Sometimes it took a long time. Sometimes I got paid for them right away. And I learned early that I should do only those things of which I was able to accept the responsibility. And if it was a thing that I knew beforehand would get me into big trouble, I waited very carefully to find out if I would be able to stand whatever was going to come or whether I should bypass it. Only a couple of times I sort of overlooked the consequences. Because while I was going to college, I used to run a little alcohol from Denver into Wyoming. Wyoming was a dry state. And I had to go through my own college town. And we had a, an officer in that town who rode a motorcycle. And this man first didn't like people, and secondly, literally hated college students, and he picked on us every chance he had. And I would come through with my uh, carload of alcohol, taking it up to, to Wyoming, and he would chase me from the city limits of Fort Collins, clear through to the border of Wyoming, which is seven miles outside of Fort Collins. And a couple of times he shot at me, and uh, I thought that was quite unneighborly at the time. And uh, obviously he missed. So I decided it was time that something should be uh, made right with this boy. And I got a friend of mine to drive a truck 
He went through town at 60 miles an hour, and I had a bale of hay in the back, and here comes my friend, the cop, on his little motorcycle, and when he got close, I dropped the bale of hay off in front of him. Things happen when you have a thing like that. I went on very happy with what I had done, very unhappy with the fact that he withstood this thing. He only put himself in the hospital for six months. Broke nearly every bone in his body. He wasn't expected to live for quite some time. And I thought that was very unfortunate. And he got out, and one thing I did do, I kept him off of motorcycles. He doesn't ride them at all. He went back to his squad car. And I felt very proud of this for a great number of years because I was showing them, those people who were picking on me. And then one time after I had been in AA, it came time to pay for this incident. And I was over in the south part of Los Angeles telling this little story, and after the meeting, a young fellow walked up to me and he said, My dad has always wondered who did that. Uh, if you don't think you're paying, you think about that a minute. You know, I'm looking around to see if Pop's in the audience, and I'm counting to see how many years it's been, what's the statute of limitations, and what's attempted murder in that state, you know, the whole bit. But fortunately, this young lad had done as I had done. He had started his way towards our organization. And he had found the doors open for him also, and he understood. And he gave me all the assurance that I needed that his father would never know who dropped the bale of hay. This is the brotherhood of understanding that we have. So if you are going to do something to one of your neighbors, make damn sure that there's somebody in the family who ultimately will be one of your brothers here in this organization. <laughs> then it came time to get into service. And I can tell you right now that if there had been more like me, we probably would have been waving the red flag today because I did very little to help my country in this last little fiasco. In the first place, I got drunk when I went to the draft board. The very first pork pick out of the uh, bar, bar, excuse me, the bowl, our county was so small that I got picked the first time. Now, I'm not supposed to be in the Army for several reasons. I'm two inches too tall. I don't see out of my left eye, and I got a two and a half inch curvature of the spine, and all of these things should keep me out, but on top of that, I'm yellow. I don't like people shooting at me. <laughs> but I get drunk, and I go down to the draft board, and the doctor there is the doctor who attended my mother at my birth, and he says, you can't make it, and I said, why? And he gave me the reasons I just gave you, plus one more, I had a bad tooth, and I said, stay right here, I'll go get the tooth fixed, which I did. And I came back and I told him, now you gotta get me into the, to the service, you gotta send me to the army doctors and let them turn me down, because by this time I had been sent from the town in Colorado over to a little town in western Nebraska, where my father owned the store, and where he said that I wouldn't have any trouble there because all they served was beer in this little town, and no good German boy got drunk on beer, and I spent the next plenty of years proving to him that he don't know what good little German boys can do with beer, because I got drunk. But I was over there, and I said, this is a small town, and I want the army to turn me down, and not you people. And then I can live in this town without anybody looking at me and calling me slacker and what have you. And so he said, fine, we'll give you a free ride at the expense of the government, but you'll be back uh, the next day. The nearest induction center was Cheyenne, Wyoming, which was 119 miles away from this little town in Nebraska. And we were taken over there on a cattle train. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with these. These are the trains back in the farming country that go in the back end of farms, and they stop at every gate and pick up a can of milk and leave off an empty can. So it took us eight and a half hours to go 119 miles on this train. And by the time we get to Cheyenne, we're feeling no pain, none of us. We're, we're feeling real great. Inside and out, everything is lovely. For the last contingent in, we walk into this great big room, there's literally hundreds of men walking around, stark naked. The doctors are all bedraggled. They've been looking at naked men all day long. We're the last contingent to look at. They want to go. We don't care. And there's two things that bother me. One is the eye chart, and the other is the height rack. I set up close enough, and I memorized both sides of the heart of the eye chart so that they wouldn't catch me on that. I didn't pay too much attention to the height rack because what can you do till you get to it? So I passed the eye chart. Came time to be measured, and I ducked my head, walked underneath, and the guy looked at me, and he said, you want to be in the service pretty bad, don't you? And I say, you want to win the war, don't you? And he did, and I was. <laughs> and then I sum up. I could go on for days and tell you about my Army career, but I will sum it up very quickly by telling you that I made Master Sergeant three times during my career in the 
service and never drew the first month's pay. <laughs> but I'm pretty proud of that because I made 28 days one time, and that ain't bad. That ain't bad. I was released, and I returned to Los Angeles. And I came into town with $15,000 in my pocket. And I landed at Hollywood Boulevard and Highland Avenue. And I went up the street to go home. And home became a little place called Benny's Bar. And I lived there for six months. And at the end of six months, Benny opened up about four very nice places down in Los Angeles. And I was looking for a job. I was now broke. He had my money and was using it constructively. I still see him once in a while and persistently ask him for the pink slip to his places because obviously it's my money that got them. He got every dime of it. It was while I was here that, again, I did those things which brought me closer to the door of Alcoholics Anonymous. I became the everything I wanted to be whenever I wanted to be it. You know, most of us are a little short of the true ambitions of our life. We want to be just a little bit better than we are capable of at the moment. We feel a little bit frustrated, so we take a few drinks, and this brings our ego up to the point where we can be what we want to be. I'm one of those very careful planners, and when I was going to be, I made quite sure that prior to doing this, I had something to go on. One of the things that I did in this home bar of mine, I was sitting in there one day, pretty well liked up, and there was a man who was buying drinks uh, frequently. And I was telling him the reason I was out here and in this drunken condition was that I was a brain surgeon, and I had been sent here from the East Coast to let down after all of these big, big operations that I were doing on the boys coming over back from overseas. It had got to my nerves, and I was told to go as far away as I could and to relax for four or five months, to get as drunk as I could, get the tension all out of me, and then come back and pick up and save the lives of these many, many injured boys who were coming back. And this guy didn't look to me like he believed one word. So I fell back on my pre planning. I had gone to the library and I had gotten a book on medicine and I had memorized a couple of pages. And I quoted to him verbatim a couple of paragraphs of these two pages. And I quit and waited for him to now smile and say, gee, it's wonderful to know such a marvelous surgeon. And instead of that, this dirty old man quoted the rest of the book because <laughs> he was a surgeon and he had offices right upstairs. And you know, I hated him. I hated him for a long time. He forced me. He forced me to leave that place. How can you stand that kind of humiliation? And this was my favorite home. And he forced me to go find someplace else to become next to Jet Pilot, one of the greatest. You don't realize how many aces I have. I could go into them, but I forget. Sometimes it's 30, sometimes it's 20. It depends upon how far along I was in my cups, but invariably, Whatever I was, I would find a true one. And this is quite embarrassing. It are these things, I believe, that create in us the need to do something about the condition we find ourselves in at the moment. Now, I bought a bar. I went to work first for the railroad, and I borrowed some money there. People call it embezzlement. This is not embezzlement. This is uh, just, I had a system of bookkeeping. They had a system of bookkeeping, you know. <laughs> Didn't sort of get together right, but if I was cut up a few dollars short, I would have paid it back. I might interject here, there are two professions that I sort of look askance at. One is the policeman. They're a necessary evil, believe me. I just sort of feel that if they could get an honest job, they probably would. The other are auditors, and I got no good words for auditors. They're sneaky. They walk in, they don't say anything, they just walk in and take over your books and they start with their idea of what should be done and they're heartless. They, they, they do bad things to you. So they created in me the need to spend eight weeks away from my job, as drunk as could be, and when I got uh, somewhat sober and realized what I had done, I fell back on the only thing I had left to fall back on at this time and that was that this wasn't my fault. And so I called my father back in Colorado, and I said, Dad, you did it again. And he said, what do you mean I did it again? And I said, well, you know what I do when I get drunk, and you started me to get drunk, and we borrowed some money from the railroad, and you're going to have to pay it off, or we're going to jail. <laughs> and so he came out, and I got out of that. 
And I was put back to work on the same railroad and was highly insulted, was told I couldn't handle any of their money anymore. And you know, this is kind of hard on your ego. After all, you're not really a thief unless you get caught. And they told me this, and I, I hated that for a long time. And so I decided the best thing to do was to buy a bar, and I did just that. Everybody knows if you own it, you sell it, you don't drink it. And I convinced my poor old father that this was the case, and so he bought the bar for me, and I started serving you people drinks. Wonderful place. Wonderful place. Tom will remember this with, with great interest, I'm sure. Tom and I have known each other for many, many years. We're active together for a great number of years down in Los Angeles in the institutional activities. It was there. Tom and I sat in this bar after I had been in AA and discussed about where we were going to steal some literature that night at which group to take out to one of the institutions. And, you know, you get honest when you get on AA, and we were making no bones about it. We were going to steal the literature to take out. We had to make it honest because at that time, we had spent so much time going to so many groups stealing their literature but when we came into a meeting, they just surrounded the literature table, you know? Just stand there, and we'd try to look around and distract their attention, and they wouldn't move, boy. They weren't about to have us. And it was there that a friend of his, who was with about both of ours, was with him, and he wanted to know what we were getting the book for, and we told him, and he said, I think our little Locker Center men's group ought to form a Buck of the Month club and give the money to you people for your literature for the institutions. Up here... This probably doesn't mean much to you because you use a pink can system. But down there, we have our literature from dollar a month contributions. And this men's group, which there were 40 men at that time, and Tom was one of the founders of that group, they supported the literature and the institutions for quite some time out of a little Locker Center men's group. But this was the bar I bought. And then I really gave in on my path to the doors of AA. I did many normal, logical things in that bar. I used to have baseball games with bar stools and hard-boiled eggs, and this is a real nice game. You don't make the place look very good, but it's fine. I got married while I was in this place. The only time that I can recall that I was happy to be a drunk and be as drunk as I was, I wanted some money one night, and my wife wouldn't give it to me, and I got to grab the butcher knife and started chasing her down the street. And she was sober, and I was drunk, and I didn't catch her. I would have killed her. And after I got sober, I remembered this, I thought, what a wonderful thing it was, that I was not drunk, because if I'd had a couple of drinks less, I probably would have caught her and would not have been able to finish my trip to Alcoholics Anonymous. But it came time for me to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I didn't know it. Because, you see, I, like everybody else along the way, had arrived at the place in my own life where I was dissatisfied. Not really dissatisfied with the conditions of my life, because I could pretty well make up with any of them. I could go to jail and lay there, or I could sleep outside, didn't make much difference. I could get along in most any area in which I found myself. But what really perturbed me was the way I personally felt, myself, how I felt. And I found that I didn't like what I was doing. I didn't like the things that I was doing. That I knew that there should be a better way for me to go. I had attempted twice before to find an answer to drinking. Both of them, I guess, were very logical. Both of them had to happen to me to make my path in AA as easy as, as it has been. I went to a sanitarium, one of those places where they shoot you with a needle and then they bring in a tray of the most gorgeous stuff that you can imagine. Water glasses full yet, anything you want. I walked in here and they put me to bed and they gave me this little shot and here comes this tray and they said, what would you like? And I said, my goodness, I came to the right place. Here is beer, wine, whiskey, anything I wanted in large glasses. And I took a little time to consider, and I found that which I thought I would have at that time, and I drank it, and I got sick. And they came back and late in the afternoon, and they gave me another little shot and another big tray, and I thought it must have been my physical condition the last time. Here's another one. I'll get well. It's always worked before. And I chose carefully, and I drank it, and I got sick. And the second day this happened, I'm not so careful with my choosing. In fact, I don't want any. And the third day, I'm not going to have any. And they bring in two boys in white jackets, big, and they hold me down, and they say, now you can choose it because you're going to get it. And they did. They poured it down me, and I got sick. And if you have ever been in such a situation, and you can imagine your stomach inside out and somebody scratching you with sandpaper, that's how you feel. And I spent two weeks not recovering from the drinking, but recovering from the recovery. That's what I was doing. And when I walked out the door, 
The man patted me on the shoulder and he said, Well, son, that's the best $250 you'll ever spend because, you see, never again will you drink. The very smell of it, perhaps even the thought of it, will make you so ill that you'll never drink again. And I thanked him because that's what I was after. And I walked two blocks down the street and I walked into a bar. And I asked the bartender for a double shot and I picked it up and started for the men's room and he said, Where are you going? And I said, I've been up the street to your friend, and he tells me if I drink this, I'm going to get violently ill, and I don't want to mess up your bar, but I want to see if I got my money's worth. And 45 minutes later, he and I are talking over some beer, and I'm so mad, I have now spent $250 of good drinking money, and I ain't sick. I'm not sick at all. I'm well on the way to getting that way, but right now I feel great. So never again did I go to the sanitarium out. The only thing that I did was, because I was an agnostic, Never truly believed in religion, per se. I went to a Catholic priest. Although I am not Catholic, I felt that perhaps they might have an answer. And this good man gave me a couple of pieces of advice, which for most heavy drinkers might have worked. I doubt seriously if they would have worked for an alcoholic. He told me if I never drank before noon, and if I didn't drink alone, I would never have a problem with drinking. And I thanked him and walked out. Because, you see, at that time of my drinking life, if it was late daylight, it was day, and if it was dark, it was night, and who could tell time anyhow? So how did you know when noon was? I never drank alone for years. I had little people, little beer ones. They were always with me. Sit alongside them. I used to tell my wife, make him quit drinking my beer, and she says, there's nobody there. Everybody could see him, I'd say. There he is. We settled all the world affairs, these little people and I. I'd go to bed, and they'd climb up on the foot of my bed the whole bit, so I never could say that I ever drank alone. I always had company. Those were the two honest attempts to stop drinking. Now, coming into AA, in my opinion, is a very interesting experience. And we get here, I believe, not by happenstance, but by a series of events beyond our own comprehension, but things that you cannot deny are spiritual. I believe the growth that each of us makes while actively participating in our alcoholism, is in a form spiritual, because it is only by bringing ourselves down literally to our knees in a moral sense, in a spiritual sense, that people like you and I, who perhaps would not have had the opportunity to find and to accept and to explore and to use a power greater than ourselves, are brought to the point where we are receptive to most anything. And so after I got into AA and I got to checking back over how I finally came into AA, I found it was perhaps the first miracle that I was completely aware of, the first miracle. Because, you see, I had been in this bar and I had been drinking for three years. I weighed 160 pounds, and on me, that's not very much. One glass of beer would pass me out, and I would sleep for a couple of three hours and wake up and take another glass of beer and go back to sleep. In my life, had asked a mutual friend how the man who was to become my introducer to AA was managing to stay sober. And he said, I don't know, but I'll send him over. And so my sponsor-to-be came across the street from where he was working into my beer joint to tell me about getting sober. This is a normal procedure in many cases, except as I check back, I find that that was not all there was to the story. It seems that my sponsor had been sober five months. He and I had drank together many times. I always considered him the lousiest drunk I ever knew in my life. He played on me a very dirty trick many years before. He was announcing the fair up here at Treasure Island, where we had been living down on Howard Street, and they found him, and he was a marvelous uh, announcer. And they took him off of Skid Row and put us in a nice apartment, and we had a living it up great for about six weeks, and he came the night to introduce the governor, and he was drunk, and he fell off the stage, and we were right out of that vice apartment, right back where we came from, and I hated him for it, because I'd gotten used to living again in sheeted beds, you know, real nice. But he had been sober, and the most obnoxious man I had ever known in my life sober. He used to come in the bar on a beautiful day like today, and beat on the bar, and in his loud voice, tell me how beautiful it was outside. I should go out and look at the sun, and then he would deliberately order eggs straight up and douse them with ketchup. So, and I would say to him, out, get out of here. I ate his 60 and a thousand times. He'd sit there and laugh. He was sober and almost as big as I was. I couldn't throw him out. 
Day after day, I go through this thing, and the things I have called that man were, were terrific, and he just left, and he came back and told me how beautiful it was outside. But you know, strangely enough, he never mentioned the fact that he wasn't drinking or how he wasn't drinking. I knew he wasn't, but how, I don't know. And I didn't ask him, and he didn't tell me. And so when it came time to me to find out, I searched around, and I found out how Jack got into Alcoholics Anonymous. This mutual friend who my wife had talked to was married, and his wife had been in the war, and she was what was in the First World War called shell shock. And she had taken off one day and gone back to New York and went to the New York Foundation and asked Bill for help for her husband out in Los Angeles. And Bill had written a letter out to the central office in Los Angeles. The central office had given it to a man named Ham Bigelow. He's been dead a great number of years. And Ham put it in his pocket. And the man called Bill, had been on AA for a short time, and he felt the need to get drunk. And so he tried to talk himself out of getting drunk, and he found no conclusion there. He kept getting closer and closer to the drink. He truly didn't want to get drunk, he said, but there was nothing else at the moment for him to do. And he recalled that he had been told that when all else fails, work with another alcoholic. And so he decided to go down and get a 12-step call out of the central office before getting drunk, just to see if it would work. And he went down to the central office, and there wasn't a 12-step call available. And he sat there for a couple of hours, and there wasn't a 12-step call came in. And he finally said, to hell with it, I'm going to get drunk. And he started out the door, and coming up the stairs was Ham Bigelow. And Ham said, Bill, what's new? And he said, I can't get the 12-step call, and so to hell with it, I'm leaving. And Ham says, I don't know whether you're interested in a cold call or not, but I've got a letter here that I haven't been able to get to. And if you'd like to take it, this is fine. So Bill said later, I decided, might as well take one more chance. And he took the letter, and he went over to this apartment house and rang the bell, and Neil came to the door. And Bill said, I knew immediately that I was in the wrong place, because here's a man whose wife has been gone a couple of weeks, and the ashtrays were clean, and the place looked neatly kept, and there were no dishes in the sink, and no good alcoholic would live in cleanliness like that, not ever. And he talked about the reason for his being there. And Neil assured him, and Bill was quite convinced that he did not need it. And so he got ready to leave and to go out and to get drunk. And as he went to close the door, Neil said, You know, you took your time to come here, and you got it done. But I work with a guy who really needs you, really and truly, he needs you. If you what you tell me is the kind of people you're looking for, he is one. And I don't know whether he'll talk to you or not, but I'll give you his name and his address if you'd like to call on him. And Bill decided... Why not? And so Bill went, and he rang the bell. And it was all those places you ring the bell on the bottom, and they push the button on the top, and you go upstairs. And he was telling both Jack and I this. He said, I looked in that door, and here is this big, flesh-faced man standing at the top of the stairs. And he said, I knew I had a rival. Just been telling me, looking at him, and he was one I was going to talk to. So Jack says to him, what do you want? And he said, I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous, and I want to talk to you about your drinking. And Jack says, get out of here. And Bill said, I just kept on walking. I'm as big as he is, and I'm healthy, and I know he can't do anything to me. And he walked right up that stairs, and he talked to Jack for a couple of hours. And Jack said, I'll do you a favor. You did me one. You came on your day off to talk to me. I'll meet you down at your Friday night meeting, and return the courtesy for you taking your time today. And that's the way that I don't think it's anything else but America that this pattern was established for my entrance into Alcoholics Anonymous by this man who I had hated twice in my lifetime, seriously hated, a man who right now I couldn't tolerate because nobody likes a sober drunk. And this man came across the street to talk to me about getting sober. And I was laying down, it was 10 o'clock in the morning, I was laying down on the cement floor in the back end of this beer joint, I'd been up 10 or 15 minutes, had my morning beer. To me, that was a day's work. It's time to rest a little bit. I'm laying down there, and he walks in, and I ask him what he wants. And he says he wants to talk about me getting sober. And I pull myself up on a little work table and told him that I didn't need him. When I got ready to quit, I would quit. Besides that, I was having too much fun. I haven't had any laying on the back room of a beer joint fun since I've been in AA. It just sort of escaped me. I find other silly ways to have fun. And he laughed and he left, and the last thing he said, if you ever want me, call me. And again, he did not talk about AA. 
And so the next day I called him, because I reached that point that night that all of us must reach, I believe, before we truly come to AA. And that's the, more, that's the moment when we're ready. And the moment that we're ready, I believe, is the very first time we walk into a door, regardless of the situation. I'm fairly convinced that never again will I have been so ready to accept help as I was at that moment. And the help I received was just right for me. You started me off badly in this organization, because Jack came the next day at my call. This time I was standing up. He walked in, and those days the book, like this one, had a red and yellow cover on it. And it was so loud, big red letters, big gold cover, just loud enough to talk to itself. He didn't have to read it. He walks through my joint with this book in his hands. <coughs> right away, everybody knows I've got a drinking problem. And, of course, I was sure nobody knew. <laughs> so he sent me up a resentment. I heard after I came into AA that you didn't make AA if you came in with any resentments. I, I don't believe that to be true. I don't think that you can make it at all unless you do have resentments, and I don't think you can come into AA without having resentments. You may be sweet and kind with everybody else around you, but if you did, as most alcoholics do, done everything in the world to keep the coming through the doors of AA, move from town to town or country to country and job to job and wife to wife and jail to jail, to keep from coming in these doors, and you are finally forced to come in here. There is a deep resentment, it appears to me, that you should have just because you have to come in the door. There is no place else to go, and you will resent this fact very, very strongly. Not only did I have that, but you set up some more, because I find myself resenting the fact that he is bringing me out to public ridicule by showing this book off in my bear joint. Of course, I had locked the door many times and kicked everybody out and said, it's my joint, you go outside. And I sat there and drank all night and told everybody what a great bar owner I was. This everybody does normally, of course. You know, you don't have a drinking problem when you do that. But he came in, and I said to him, how do I get sober? And he says, it's simple. In our book called Alcoholics Anonymous in Chapter 5 entitled How It Works, it says, and he read. And I said, fine, but how do I get sober? And he said, I'm telling you, in our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, in chapter 5, entitled How It Works, it says, and blip, he reads a bunch of stuff, and I said, fine, but how do I get sober? And he says, I'm telling you, in our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, in chapter 5, entitled It Says, blip, and he goes on some more, and I said, and pardon the French, I said, God damn it, how do I get sober? He looks at me, and very seriously, he says to me, it's simple. You just stop drinking. I've been drunk for three years. I'm smart enough to know that the only way you get drunk is to drink, and the only way you get sober is not to drink, and here is a nut insulting my intelligence by telling me it's simple, all I gotta do is to stop drinking to get sober. I didn't have to ask him for that. I didn't have to ask anybody. That I knew, you see. So that was the second resentment. He said a lot, and he said, don't drink today and we'll go to a meeting tonight, and I managed to weather through the day. Didn't die. Came close. By the time it came time to go to the meeting, I'm at that position where many of us are, where we still want to do something about our drinking, but don't want to close the door tightly. Something might happen that you don't like, so you want a logical way for yourself to get out. And he came and took me across town, and it was dark, and it was in September. And I say the last thing that I had to keep from closing myself in, if this has anything to do with religion, it won't work for me. And he assured me it did not. And I told him the story about going to the Catholic priest. And he assured me this had nothing to do with religion. And I told him I was an agnostic because in the mortuary that my father had and as I grew up, it was my little duty to take the manifests, the manuscripts of the sermons of the funerals and to put them in booklet form and we passed them back to the family. And I had noticed that throughout the years that the same scripture used by various ministers of various faiths never seemed to have the same conclusion. They didn't seem to agree on it, so why should I agree at all? And I told Jack this has nothing to do with, the, with religion whatsoever. Drove up in front of the congregational church and says, here we are. <laughs> here we are. And so I went to my first meeting. Not only with my own pre-built-in resentments, but with yours right along with them. And they were doozies. And I went into this meeting, and I didn't hear anything at all, I believe, of the first speaker. And the second speaker did that which is necessary, I believe, to create the curiosity which brings you back to your second and third and 400th meeting. What he said, as I understand it today, has truly nothing to do with the philosophy of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
Well, what he said was nothing, again, and I believe a truly spiritual basis, that creates within me, or any newcomer who might be coming to us, an unanswered question, and one that perhaps will never be answered, like faith and God and miracle. But strong enough presented that the person receiving it and listening to it uses it when everything else seems to fail to come back. And the coach spoke about being stabbed seven times in the back and waking up in the Santa Monica hospital and hearing the doctor say that this man should be dead. We've done everything we possibly could. And yet he was alive. And later on in his talk, he mentioned his brother who had studied for the priesthood and who was vitally interested in the youth of his city and who at 36 years of age had died from tuberculosis. And I got to thinking about that on the way home. A man who was given every opportunity under this sun to die, who was no good to himself or to his community or to a There was one, and he lived. And on the other hand, here was a man who had studied for good, who was of great concern to his community, and to his God, if there be one, and to himself, and he was taken away. And why was this? The bad was left and the good was taken. And that created in me enough desire to come back to find the answer. And it still creates in me the desire enough to come back to find the answer. For I keep coming back, and I keep coming back. And then I was fortunate enough to meet those who were to prepare me for this walk of life. And I heard very early that in this organization you will find experiences and examples which you can use because it is your choice. Once you become sober, the choice is put back into your hand. And if you use this choice wisely, you never again will find it necessary to take a drink. And you have a choice here of proof positive. Because on this pathway of life, one side is walked by those who came to Alcoholics Anonymous simply because they had to, simply because they drank too much alcohol. And they came here, and they faltered, and they stumbled, and there's somebody alongside who's holding up their arm and giving them strength and pushing them along the right side of the road. And step by step and question by question and answer by answer, they seem to get stronger and stronger until soon they're walking in life with the happiness they never thought possible, with the happiness of their own, or the knowledge that every situation they face, they will face without taking a drink, be it good or be it bad. And that they will always be able to walk with their hand out for those who choose to walk on the other side of the street. And these are the poor people of AA who are as alcoholic as you and I, but who you and I have allowed the privilege of drinking again, simply because of our dereliction to the philosophy that is so spiritual. These are the people who stumble, who use every bit of rationalization open to them to go again and to take a drink. These are the ones who come in and out of AA time after time and who stumble and fall, and unfortunately those on that side of the street are unable because of their own weakness and their own struggle and their own faltering steps to reach down and give the strength that's necessary for that man or that woman to get up and to walk in pride and in happiness, and to walk across the street with you and I. And they lay there, and as we walk down this street, I see on this other side many, many times those who are unable to get up, and those who laid there, and those who died, and those who went insane and remain, in my opinion, as dead as if they were buried. And the road is littered on that side, and it's good, it's good, because I can walk, and I can see, and I can feel, and I can use. And this is what I'm here for. And the way that I was given this interpretation was by the first few men that I met in AA. And they told me things that are not quite popular, I suppose, in AA today, but they are truths, and truths are hard to take, I'm sure. And the first thing that seemed so strong to me <laughs> that my friend said, don't ever, when you get drunk, call me, because I won't talk to you. You know where AA is, and if you want to talk about it, you will come back there, and I'll be there, and I'll talk to you. But I'm not going to waste my time on you if you choose to drink again. Because you have been here long enough to know that the basis of your being here is that you drank too much. And the second man told me, 
That man, by the way, I hated for a little while, too, because, you see, I'm an alcoholic, and I got my feelings on the sleeve, and you don't talk to a new baby like that. You might drive him out to get drunk. And I thought you were a mean old man to tell me this. But, you know, I attended his 25th birthday here a couple of months ago. And Dick spoke about it last night, because we were talking about it. About 400 years of sobriety in that little group that met there, 25, 25 and a half, 22, 24, 19... And Dick wasn't kidding when he said, is there anybody here for their first 15 years in AA? Who's the baby of the crowd? Because that's about what it was. Real, real interesting. The next thing that I heard was, never to forget that you have a twofold disease, an allergy of the body coupled with the obsession of the mind, and that it is the allergy that brings you here, and it is the allergy that will take you away if you get into it. And don't ever believe, said Jim to me, don't ever believe that drinking is merely a symptom to a deeper-seated disease. Because nobody ever came here to get rid of a better shot of obsessions. Nobody came here to get rid of all of their neuroticisms. They came here because they drink too much. It may be a quart, it may be a fifth, it may be a pint, it may be just a glass, as it was with me when I came in. But that's why I came here. And I remain a member of this organization of Alcoholics Anonymous as long as I don't drink. As soon as I drink, I no longer am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And Jim said to me further, it is only because you are sober that you will be able to attack the obsessive, trusty thinking that you have, these things that make you uncomfortable, because you're sober, not in spite of it. And once you give up soberness, the basis of your future life, you give all right of reason about your future life. Don't forget it. And so I don't. I think I'm here because I drank too much. I believe that that's the seriousness of the disease. I believe that's what will kill me and would have killed me. The drinking and the drinking alone would have done. And then Jim said to me also, I never want to hear you say to anybody that the door swings both ways unless you are willing to accept the responsibility of the remark. And I said, what do you mean by that, Jim? And he said, well... Alcoholics of our type are those who search very diligently for a way out, even as you did when you came in here. And if you give them one little glimmer that they can use as a reason in their own mind to take another drink, and they use it, and they die, then you must be willing to stand up in front of that same group and to say, I am a murderer. I gave this man or this woman the right to go out and drink again because I told he or she that the door swings both ways. And if you are alcoholic, he said to me, you have, by the time you say it the very first time, you have taken the time necessary to find out what it is to be an alcoholic and what it means to drink if you are an alcoholic. And it means simply this. If you be an alcoholic and if you drink, you die. Just as simple as that. You die. And once we are here and have been sober for a small length of time, the idea of death, per se, sort of loses. I think the spiritual growth begins immediately, and the spirit, in my opinion, is that flight that we take until the time that this power chooses to call us to wherever we're going to go. And so we do not run to death. Rather than that, we fight away from it. And if I give anybody the opportunity to say what you said, then I am killing that person. And so I don't say it. And so I say that when you come to AA for the first time, you are as sick as you're ever going to be. And I was told also that when I came here, I would find but one thing. First, I was told, find the important part of the book. And I searched and I searched, because in this book so filled with truth, what is more important than another? And I searched, and I couldn't find. And I would talk to Jim, and Jim would say, search further. And finally, he said, it's in the preamble. And I read the preamble. And I hear it read nearly every night at a meeting. And what's so important there, much more than anything else? And finally, he said, it's in the second paragraph. And I read the second paragraph over and over, and I listened carefully at the meeting, and I didn't find it. And finally, he said to me after many days, you hear it read at each meeting, Jack. Our story is disclosed in a general way, or it used to be like, and what happened? If you are ready to, have, to get what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. And I said, yes, I have read it. And he said, in that second sentence, is the key to your life, is the key to your spiritual growth, is the key to your soberness, and best you find it. If you've decided you want what we have, 
And he said, Where are the wee of the way? And I looked around. And you are the wee, all of us. Men and women, short and fat, long and tall, married and unmarried, the whole bit, that is the wee. And to what lengths are we willing to go to? And then he said, There is the key to your life. The end of that phrase. Because therein is a little black line called a hyphen. And that's the key. That's the important part of this whole philosophy. Because it tells you specifically, stop and consider. Take time to think. Do you want what we have? And to what lengths are you willing to go to get it? And before you can say you go to any lengths, you must know what we have. And so I look around at this room today, as I do every time I am in a group of people. And I look to see what we have that I want. And I find this room filled with people with varying degrees of happiness, I'm sure, and varying degrees of sadness, varying degrees of serenity, varying degrees of hate and frustration and fear, and yet you're here, and the book tells me to find that which we have, that I want. And some of you are wealthy and some of you are not. And some of you are working and some of you aren't. And some of you have children and some of you are married and the whole bit. And yet here we are, are we, and what do we have that I want? And I look around and I know that I can't have all of these things. I can't be married and unmarried at the same time. I can't be rich and poor at the same time. And yet it says here specifically, take time to find out that which we have that you want. And I find there is but one thing here that you have that is universal to all of us that I must choose to want. And that's soberness. Being without alcohol. Nothing more, nothing less. Very simple very dull, very unimaginative. But that's all we have collectively, is that we are sober. Not all of us filled with sobriety. To me, sobriety encompasses many things. Happiness, serenity, faith, fear, frustration, all of them wrapped up together in a program that makes you feel comfortable at any given moment. I feel comfortable oft times when problems are so strong that I don't know where to turn. And yet there seems to be a feeling within me now that I know that whatever's bothering at this time will pass, will pass, may take some time, but it will go away, and something will come along that's better than it was. Not always as I would want it, but at least better than it was. And then it says, once I found out that you had soberness, and this is what I wanted, and I made a careful research of whether I wanted to be sober, there's many things to be said about drinking, if you can handle it. Many things. Conviviality, lots of fun in bars, the whole bit. I'm one of those, by the way, who looks at television right now and I see these little animals flapping their tails and pulling their guns and shooting and it says, hands, beer, and I drool. Right down on my toes, I drool. I like it, you know? These sort of things I had to consider that I wanted and to what lengths would I go. And I was told one of the greatest lengths I would have to go to was go to the meetings. Go to the meetings. And I said to my sponsor, my, my friend who got me in, said to him, how many? He says, as many as you can. And I said, well, how many is that? He said, every night, and walked off. So for six years, I went seven nights a week. For the next six years, I went five nights a week. Next six years, for heaven's sakes, I'm going three and four nights a week. And this last year now, I've been going almost that many right now, almost that many, because you see, I'm of the opinion that when you pick a sponsor, he's got the answer. But let me warn you something here. Before you pick a sponsor, make sure that you understand what sponsorship is. You have got a lot of co-sponsors around you. Ask questions of many, many people, but never forget. When everybody else fails to give you the correct answer in your estimation, remember that your sponsor will do it, and that you are not to take a drink until your sponsor gives you the answer, until you talk to him. So choose carefully. And I chose Jack very carefully, because I know when everything else fails, and I've worked with an alcoholic, and even that seems to fail, I will ask him, and he will have the answer. And he's in Australia, and I ain't got the fare to go to Australia. Okay? So make all for sure that your sponsor is inaccessible at the final moment, and you'll find that this a lot of times, a series of songs, just might keep you sober. Also, they told me that if I would do these things, as I went along, I would come to believe in a power. And I laughed, because I was an agnostic. It took me about six years truly to overcome the feeling that I had in this area. I always believed there was something that made this universe, and everybody called it God, and that was fine. I did not believe in dogma religion, as I have said before, 
I believe the edifice is a necessary thing in any town, and I would not want many children of mine to be raised in a town that didn't have it, because I think it is a wonderful moral atmosphere. But for me, an alcoholic, to believe in the philosophy, I would have to believe as that particular faith said, and I could not do it. And so I became an agnostic, one who believes that the moment of my death and the moment of my birth were the only two moments that this power had any say-so. Between those two moments, everything was in my hands that I did as I chose best for me. And they said to me, that isn't exactly the way it works, but if you will do these things as you go along, you will find proof on this path, because of these experiences and these examples, that will prove to you beyond your own doubting that God is. And that's why you're here. That's why you're here, Jack, whether you know it or not, to find and to believe that God is. For when you find that belief, all at once it will turn from belief into faith when there is no question. And this is what AA will offer you if you stay sober. And it will be proven to you, I was told. It's a hard thing to prove, isn't it? And yet, it came to me most graphically, and it will come to everybody in this room if you but stick around. I became interested in institutional activity in Southern California, and in so doing, met many, many people. Met, went many, many miles, did much. I have to grin a little bit here, because sitting on the stage again is Tom. Tom is active in our, our group down in Los Angeles, and he's the kind of alcoholic that's real nice. We told him he couldn't go up to a camp and start a group. It was up in the top of a hill. He said, you can't do that. Couldn't do it because he didn't have enough sobriety. He wouldn't know what to do. So he didn't do it, except he went there every week for five years. So I couldn't start the meeting, but I'm going up there, and we're talking what's in the book. Did it for five years. Five years, huh? Very really wonderful proof. But in this particular activity, I went out to an institution, a local county institution, and after the meeting, a big Indian boy came up to us. I'm standing at the back end of this barracks, and this man walks towards me, and he was real mean, and he was real ugly. The meanest man I've ever seen in my life, I believe. His eyes were close set. He's the kind you wouldn't want to meet in an alley in broad daylight with cops on both ends of it. Just that mean. And he walked up to me and very belligerently he said, you mean you haven't had a drink this year? And I said, no, I haven't. And he walked away. And then the next year I was at another one of our local institutions. And after the meeting, this dark, mean Indian boy came up and he said, you mean you haven't had a drink this year either? And I said, no, I haven't. And he walked away. And the third year, I'm in another one of our local county institutions, and here comes the chief. And he asked the same question, and I gave him the same answer. And the fourth year, I went to Chino. And after the meeting, my good friend, the chief, came up. And he said, I said to him the same question. And he said, yeah, Jack, same question. I said, the same answer. I haven't been drunk this year either. And he said very seriously, in four years in four different institutions, I would ask you one question, and I've gotten the answer. And it's always been the same. You haven't had a drink this year either. Now, i got 27 months to do in this place, and when I get out, I'm going to try what you're talking about. And I don't know whether it's going to work or not, but I'm going to try it. And he did his time, and he got out, and he became very active in Alcoholics Anonymous and in his groups. And he did that which is necessary to establish for him a program of soberness and a life of sobriety. He picked up the chairs, and he did the 12-step work. We did all that any of us would want anybody to do with and for us. And he got ill, and he was taken to the hospital. And they operated on him, and they found that he had cancer and that he did not have much longer to live. Now I'm one of those who have always considered this first drink philosophy as just words. And it's very strange that as you go along, the things that truly perturb you come and answer. And they come in the most peculiar ways, because here is the chief, so sick, who wrote a letter to me to find out if I thought he had lost his length of sobriety, because while in the hospital they had given him a tray of medication, and in this medication was a shot of alcohol, and he drank it. And he said in his letter, which I cherish very highly today, he said, you know, Jack, immediately the thought came to me, I know when the nurse will make her rounds, I know where my clothes are, I felt I could get my clothes on, get downtown, get me a bottle, and be back in bed before she made her rounds back here. 
a man sick almost to death, and he proved to me the deadliness of the first drink, that we come here to get sober and to stay sober. And the chief got out of the hospital. And a few months later, I got a call from the Long Beach Naval Hospital. And they said that the chief was there and that he was dying and that he would like to talk to him. And I live in North Hollywood, which is quite a long way from Long Beach, and this is before the freeways, but it's a long way down there. And I got to driving down and saying, I wonder what I'm going to talk about. What do you say to a good friend who goes down? What do you talk about? You Nobody's been there to tell you it's going to be all right. You don't know what. And I believe for the second time in my life, a truth of the miracle came to me. The truth that God would show himself to me came because all of a sudden it wasn't necessary for me to worry at all about what we were going to talk about. And I drove the rest of the way to the hospital and I was taken to his room and the nurse says the chief is going to die. You can't stay very long. And so I walk in. And I say, hi, chief. And he said, hi, Jack. And we talked about a few of the boys and girls in AA, a few of the meetings and the usual small chit-chat. And all of a sudden the chief said, Jack, let's talk about my dying. And I said, all right, let's talk about my dying. <clears throat> he said, you know, I've tried to make amends to all the people that I know of, that I have hurt, <clears throat> excuse me, the ones I've hurt the most are my dad and mother. They've gone a long time ahead of me, but now, although I believe that they know what I have done, now I'm going to get to tell them face to face. And this mean old man, this ugly old Indian boy, now became the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. And he said to me, <laughs> more than that, Jack, I'm going to get to shake God's hand. And the nurse said, you'll have to leave you. And I went to the door, and the chief in the whisper said, Jack. And I said, yes. And he said, don't forget when it's your turn, I'll be waiting at the door to meet you. And I would guarantee all of you people today that no matter how you approach the philosophy of Alcoholics Anonymous, if you will but stay sober and will follow the path of the people ahead of you who manage to stay sober in spite of all the situations that come into their life daily, the crisis that might create in our desires and in our minds the fact that drinking would be better than the way it is, if you will but look at the examples on the other side of the room, and we'll walk step by step with those ahead of you who stay sober. But when it's your turn, the chief will be there to meet you too. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.